I'm pleased to be introducing Maria Stoika, who is going to give the seminar today on the scientific variables ontology or the webinar. And uh, I, I first hired Maria yeah. to work with me at CU um, back in, it was uh, end of December or December, 2015. And she was one of several candidates, but by far the, the best applicant um, for this position, like overqualified. But she, <clears throat> she has a PhD in environmental, uh, energy, environmental and chemical engineering, but she had an interest in, in doing um, uh, scientific programming type of work and had taken lots of Coursera courses that were very impressive. And so she was a good fit for this position. And uh, ever since we've been working together and she's been on several EarthCube projects with me and, and one DARPA project, um, continuing to work mostly on that scientific variables ontology. And that for those of you, she'll explain this, I'm sure, but <clears throat> this uh, started with work on the CSDMS standard names that I initiated uh, some time ago. And we wanted to formalize that into an official ontology that was uh, more compatible with state-of-the-art ways of doing ontologies. And so that's what she's been doing for, for these number of years, mostly. And it's been fantastic. It's been really great working with her. And uh, in 2018, she was promoted to research associate, so she can start bringing in grants on her own if she so chooses. And then um, She's also was asked, which is kind of a, an honor, she was asked to co-chair the Research Data Alliance um, iAdopt Working Group, which has taken some of the ideas from the Scientific Variables Ontology into their ontology. So they've been inspired by, by our work to try to um, describe variables, and that's being used by them. And so without further ado, I will let Maria um, take over. Uh, thank you so much, Scott, and thank you so much, uh, CSDMS, for um, having me um, present our work on SVO. Um, I, I was going to say, I think Scott was breaking up for me during the introduction a little bit, so I wanted to wave and say hi so you all can see what I look like, but I will turn my video off um, just because I want to make sure um, that you can hear what I'm saying, um, because that's more important than my face. So, um, without further ado, let me share my screen. And all right. So you can see I did a very quick, um, simple edit to the title of the talk today. And that was because um, the original title was supposed to be a simple introduction to the scientific variables ontology. Um, but I decided the word gentle was a little bit more appropriate. And that's because as you see, um, SVO is a solution to quite a complex problem in many ways. Um, and so SVO is not really simple um, because it, it, it can't really be, it's, it's a very complex problem. Um, however, I'm going to make this a very gentle introduction. I will try not to go too much into the uh, technical details or um, spend too much time on um, very on, you know, ontological definitions. Um, and I'll try to, uh, do as many examples, concrete examples um, that hopefully you all can relate to. Um, so yeah, so let's get started. So a little bit of background, if you're affiliated with CSDMS, um, it's very likely that you do computational work in the sciences um, and you're familiar with the fact that computational work in the sciences requires electronic resources such as data and models. Um, and models have inputs and outputs. Um, and some of those inputs can come from data sets while others may come directly from the outputs of other models. Um, and this information that is exchanged between um, these resources that we're interested in um, are the scientific variables. And in this presentation, I'm going to focus on 
how do we know that these scientific variables that are passed between data sets and models, um, how do we know what they really are? What are the concepts um, that these scientific variables represent? Um, so I will not be focusing um, on how these variables are collected or how they're stored, um, what the format of files is or what the structure of those files is. Uh, we're purely interested in the concepts represented by the scientific variables. And the problem of interoperability that arises um, is from this question of how do you know if a resource is appropriate to use as an input to a model? And conversely, if you've created a resource and you want to share it with others, how do others know um, that your resource might be the resource that they need? And so metadata provides a good solution to this. Um, and in case you're not familiar with metadata, uh, metadata is everywhere on the internet. Uh, and you can think of metadata as tags um, that are attached to your uh, electronic resources. They may be embedded inside of the resource or external to the resource. Um, and these tags uh, may contain different types of labels um, that can essentially summarize what is contained inside your resource. And this summary can be used by search engines such as Google, um, or it can just be used internally in um, databases or in repositories uh, to index your, uh, um, your resources and uh, make them findable. Um, and metadata is great. Um, well, in some ways, <laughs> metadata is great, um, but Metadata is not always structured, um, so sometimes metadata can be found in uh, freeform text, or alternately, uh, it may not follow a common set of representation principles across resources. So if a resource, say, uses a standard um, to represent a scientific variable, uh, it may not be the same standard that another resource may use. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, that means we need a common language for representing scientific variables, um, or we could call this a standard. We need a standard that is the mother of all scientific variable standards, right? Um, and in the earth sciences, we do have a lot of standards or um, if not necessarily standards, just um, lists of variables to pick from. So, uh, you might be familiar with the USGS and West parameter codes or the climate and forecasting standard names. Um, you also have the CSDMS standard names um, built right here in house. Um, you also have NASA's suite ontologies, the GCMD keywords, um, and so many more. I'm just popping up here the ones that I'm most familiar with, but I'm sure you know many others. Um, so, and this brings up a really nice quote um, that I like that has a little bit of humor to it, which is that the great thing about standards is that there are so many to choose from. And the reason this is funny is because the, the whole point of a standard is that there should really only be one, right? That we should all be able to agree on a standard and all um, use that one standard. Um, but it's hard for different groups to agree because different groups might need um, their standards to do different things or to have different functionalities. Um, what I also thought was funny in context of this presentation with this quote is that it was attributed to Grace Hopper or to Andrew Tenenbaum or to a list of other possible um, attributes. And so um, even in this quote, um, people could not um, agree <laughs> as to um, who actually said it. And so what I'm gonna be talking to you about today um, is SVO, which is not, um, its intent is not to be a standard, which is the mother of all standards. Um, instead, what, it's, uh, what SVO is intended to be is a common language for computers to try to read uh, scientific variables in all different kinds of forms and try to understand uh, what 
is um, what is the intended scientific variable that is being described. Um, and so SVO uh, is developed as a child, if you will, of the CSDMS standard names. And this work was um, very lengthy and detailed and important, and it really highlighted the fact that there are essential components of scientific variables that are common to most standards. Um, and that some standards may be missing some components that are essential. Some standards may have extraneous components that are not um, domain independent and that are maybe not found across a lot of standards. But there are some core concepts uh, with regards to scientific variables that occur or are implied again and again and again. Um, and this is what SBO tries to tackle. So SVO um, encodes these core components in a way that machines can understand. Um, they can say, oh, okay, you know, you're, you're telling me that you're talking about a scientific variable. So I'm going to look for these components because I know that human scientists um, refer to these components um, when they're mentioning scientific variables. And so what is SVO exactly? Um, and I tried to distill it down to a couple of sentences, but there really are quite a few components to SVO itself. Um, but overall, we think of SVO as a framework for representing scientific variables in a machine readable form. And it's particularly useful in automating computational scientific workflows. Um, and this framework enables what we call modular principled expression, manipulation, and creation of scientific variable concepts. And so the components of SVO that allow this, um, all this uh, functionality are outlined here. And uh, the first one is an upper ontology which essentially just defines a set of elementary concept categories. Um, some might use the term atomistic, um, and some of these primary ones are the property, the phenomenon, or the process. Um, and these are used to build complex scientific variables. So these concept categories, um, you can think of them as ways to classify your terminology. And secondly, there are also a set of design patterns that allow you to combine these elementary or atomistic classes to create more complex co concepts and thus also more complex variables. And because the design patterns are reduced to be a simple set of design patterns, so uh, just, um, just it's under 10 design patterns that you can use. Uh, to represent um, uh, the different components um, and combinations in scientific variables with SVO, um, that can turn out to create quite bulky representations of variables. And so what we've also introduced is a set of rules um, that can be used to infer relationships between atomistic components that might, might be chained together across um, multiple relationships. Um, and this can be used to condense down the representation to a simpler representation, um, which will result in more diverse relationships between entities but it allows the simpler representation that is more easily searchable. Uh, we also have an extensible lower ontology that contains the, main, uh, the domain specific um, instances of the classes defined in the upper ontology. And so one thing, um, you can think of this as basically just the terminology um, uh, that you're using to define your variables. Um, and one thing that I want to emphasize here is that SVO does not consider itself um, an authority in what um, terms you should use. And we do currently uh, encourage um, pointing to external resources that define these instances in the lower ontology. We prefer to use um, 
uh, Wikipedia and Wikidata um, because these can be editable by anyone. Um, but you could also, of course, link to um, official ontologies. Um, and we do allow creating uh, a stub or a placeholder um, if you are not able to find a definition in an external ontology. Um, but again, we do not define that term um, for you. Um, and lastly, we have three tools um, that you can use with SVO. Uh, the first is to search for existing variables um, that are already represented in the ontology. So we have indexed um, a lot of the climate and forecasting variables, as well as the CSDMS standard names um, and the NWS parameter codes um, into SVO form. So those are available for you to search. Um, we also have a tool for comparing um, the existing variables that are represented and determining whether um, they are similar and in what ways they might differ. Um, and we're also working on a tool for guided creation of new variables from freeform text. So I'm just going to dive right in. I don't want to spend too much time on the nitty gritty details. I'm just going to dive right in on the major SVO design patterns. Um, and the first one, which is um, probably the most important one, um, which is derived from the CSDMS standard names, is this idea that any scientific variable should be able to be decomposed into two distinct components. Um, the first is the object of observation, which we call the phenomenon, and the second is the property. Um, which inheres in that phenomenon. And um, in addition, when you have a quantitative property, um, that property may be uh, defined with respect to a reference. And in that situation, the reference is required as well. So diving deeper into these two core components, the phenomenon and the property, there are uh, in essence, two types of phenomena, um, but the phenomena at large is a four-dimensional entity. Um, so it has spatial aspects and temporal aspects. Um, but a static phenomenon, which can be thought of as an object or a body, um, here I've put up the very ontological definition, which um, we're not gonna get into the details of that, but it's, it's official definition is an independent concrete entity, which can be or is observed to exist or happen. Um, here, I'm essentially just showing the design pattern for what you can think of as an object or a body, which is a static phenomenon, which does not necessarily involve a process, um, but to which you can attach different attributes um, so you can specify it at a highly granular level. And an attribute is simply a property value pair. Um, and um, we do also provide some shorthand notation for the certain attributes that occur again and again and again, such as form, matter, role, and part. Um, we're going to give some examples, so um, don't worry too much about what each of these is. Um, and now, as I mentioned before, uh, there are also dynamic phenomena. So these are phenomena that involve processes. And for phenomena that involve processes, um, the design pattern um, is a bit different, and it involves uh, what we call participants. Um, which are other phenomena. So again, these may be objects um, or uh, more complex phenomena. Uh, and these uh, participants, um, uh, as they participate in the process, um, this process may also have a trajectory. Uh, so going to the property, um, the property is a characteristic of the object of interest of the scientific variable. And one of the things about the property is that its existence is not independent. Its existence um, depends on the phenomenon that it inheres in. And so here you can see uh, some of the relationships between a property and some of the other entities in the ontology. Um, and for quantitative properties, 
uh, we know that a quantitative property may have dimensions. A quantitative property, property may also be operated on by some mathematical um, operation or transformation. Uh, it may also have a property type, and this means things like um, if it's a vector or a scalar. Um, and in addition to this, a property may also pertain to what we call an abstraction, but you can think of this as a mathematical model for a phenomenon. And in that context, uh, a property may also have a property role, such as being an exponent or a parameter. So um, here we're going to look at some examples. Um, we've talked a lot about the theoretical, um, but what are some examples of scientific variables? Well, they can be very simple. Um, we could have something like the height of a tree or the shape of an organism, or you could have the solubil solubility of carbon dioxide in water, where you have two target phenomena that you're looking at. You could be looking at the low level of chemical oxygen demand in unfiltered water, um, or something more complex like the time integral of the volume flux of water infiltrating the soil surface. Um, or lastly, you can have this very complicated one um, that I will not read. Um, but I hope that you can see as I've been talking about these different components of a scientific variable that no matter how complex um, you, if you study these descriptions enough, you can see that you can actually divide these descriptions into an object of interest and a corresponding property. So here are some examples of an object of interest. Again, we start with the simpler ones um, and we build our way up to much more complicated ones. And we have phenomena that are static. So they're just like, you can think of them as objects or bodies. And we have phenomena that involve processes. So they're dynamic. And we also have phenomena that include um, a lot of other information um, such as context. And here are some examples of properties. We have qualitative properties such as shape, quantitative vector properties such as velocity, um, uh, properties that um, may be properties between two different um, objects such as the sun and the moon, uh, sorry, the earth and the moon. Uh, we have electrical conductivity, uh, molar concentration, which is the property of um, some uh, entity and another entity. Um, we have coverage severity code, which is um, a sort of, you could think of it as a um, pseudo quantification of a qualitative uh, property. Um, we can have properties that are transformed by mathematical operations. Um, but all in all, these are all properties. Uh, here I'm showing just a few examples, uh, one from CSCMS, one from the CF uh, standard names, and one from NWIS of variables and how they're decomposed into their um, corresponding uh, object of interest or phenomenon and property. Um, and here are some examples of when you have a specific distinct phenomenon, how you could decompose it into its attributes um, to describe it. So here, for example, you have filtered water, um, you have a grain of sand um, where the form is a grain and the matter is sand um, or the bottom of the atmosphere. Um, furthermore, here, the previous, the ones that I showed on the previous slide were what we call bodies or objects or static phenomena. On this page, um, I'm showing dynamic phenomena. So these are phenomena that, for example, involve um, the motion of the earth or um, turning of fresh water or um, collection of a bed, a bed sediment sample. But again, these can also be decomposed into participants and the corresponding processes. 
Here, um, I'm showing some examples of properties um, and how properties can be decomposed. Um, and the second two here, you can see that there are uh, mathematical operations um, that act on um, the core properties. Um, the first one is an interesting example of a property that um, is associated with um, a mathematical model of a phenomenon, um, the Flint law, and that also has a property role um, in that phenomenon, um, which is that it is the exponent. Uh, so you might remember that I mentioned that for some variables, there may also be um, a reference required, which is a basis or standard for evaluating the value of the scientific variable. And we do provide a design pattern for decomposing um, this reference. However, again, just as with everything that I've covered so far, um, not every decomposition needs to be made. Um, the more decomposition that you can make, the easier it is to understand what the variable is. Um, but in some cases, it may be too tedious um, to expand this out. And so um, ultimately, uh, some things may not be expand it out. Um, I also mentioned that some phenomena are complex and you may want to include extra context um, for the phenomenon of interest. And so this is a design pattern to provide that context. And we'll go over some examples um, right here on this slide. Um, so here you can see, for example, we might be talking about carbon dioxide from anthropogenic emission. Um, and so the anthropogenic emission is the context in that case. Uh, you might be interested in some properties of soil that is five feet below the land surface. And in that case, um, five feet below the land surface is the context. Um, in this other uh, more complicated example of the oil slick, um, you have two contexts that are provided, one that it's on shore and one that it's within 25 feet um, of the uh, bed sediment sample collection. Uh, we also have a participant design pattern, um, which you might remember that I mentioned when I was talking about phenomena that involve processes. And so when we have a process, um, it it might be necessary to identify um, for the participant phenomena uh, what their roles are um, in that uh, process. In addition to that, um, the participant design pattern also allows us to assign what we call variable roles. Um, and this can help us deduce um, how a particular phenomenon is used to evaluate the property um, that's identified in a scientific variable. So if the property refers to multiple um, phenomena such as a, a solute and a solvent, the variable role could help us uh, determine uh, which phenomenon plays which role. Um, here we have some examples of um, phenomena involving processes um, and uh, how they might have multiple participants and each participant has a participant role. Um, and again, just because you identify a participant, you do not need to identify a participant role. Um, that should really only be identified if it's, it is deemed critical to the scientific variable. And lastly, I just wanted to show you, um, this is really simple. I'm not sure that you could even call it a design pattern. Um, this is um, just the relationship between a phenomenon and a, an, an abstraction. And so this is just a mathematical representation of a phenomenon. Um, and this is just how you would link the two together. And so some examples of this would be um, that, for example, the temporal decay of aftershocks in a seismic sequence um, is, um, has a mathematical abstraction called the modified Amori law, or the initiation of motion of sediment in a fluid flow can be described by Shields formula. Um, and here I also put that the Shields parameter 
is the critical parameter in the Shields formula. And so you can see how that links circularly um, since the Shields parameter is a property that is associated with um, this mathematical model. So um, we're getting to the end um, of the presentation. And I just wanted to plop on here our most um, commonly asked question, which is, this is complicated. Um, and the answer is, it, it is, um, it really is. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a complicated problem. Um, and that is why there are so many standards and so many people out there trying to um, decide, you know, what's the best way to describe these scientific variables in a way that machines can understand. Um, and I do think that, um, SVO is a, is a great tool for doing this, um, and we are aiming to automate as much of this process that I've been talking about as uh, possible um, so that you, as a scientist, um, do not have to worry about it. Um, um, it, is, it, is, it is good um, to have a basic understanding of what SVO is trying to do, um, because with the automation, uh, process, there might be issues um, in the translation, you might have to make corrections, so it's good to understand what's going on under the hood. Um, but that is what we're trying to get to. Um, and in the meantime, what I hope you're getting from this presentation mostly is that um, uh, it's not so much that we're pushing that it's necessary for you to completely decompose a scientific variable representation um, down to its very atomistic components, um, but that um, I've gotten across the importance of understanding that um, there are these core components of a scientific variable. So when you do label your resource, um, if you want to make it accessible to others, I think it's very important to make sure that you're identifying your object of interest um, of your scientific variable, that you're identifying your property, um, that if there is a reference um, for evaluating that property that you're, evalu uh, that you're representing this, um, any, any uh, context that might be important for, uh, you deem important for identifying the scientific variable, um, that should be identified as well. Uh, in the meantime, I do encourage you to check out our new website. Um, we're still updating it, um, but um, we have some new content up there. I'm also sharing um, the GitHub of where the web, because uh, we have this hosted off of GitHub pages. Just in case you want to check that, that would be an easy way to follow um, when we do make updates to the website. Um, also, don't hesitate to email us with questions. Um, and in conclusion, um, I just wanted to say that I think um, I'm, I'm very grateful that Scott gave me the opportunity to work on this project. Um, and I think that SVO um, has a really good potential for um, becoming a very powerful language for um, understanding scientific variables um, from the perspective of a machine who's trying to read it and is trying to understand resources um, and make them available to scientists. So with that, um, thank you for listening to my talk and I'll take any questions if there are any. Uh, do I, I see that Leslie has her hand up. Um, how do I? Uh, I figured I saw the, I finally read the pop-up and understood that I could unmute myself. Hello, Maria. <laughs> Hi, Leslie. Uh, thanks very much for that gentle introduction. It, I think you met your goal. Of course, I still have questions, but at least I've now seen the overview. And my question is, um, after many years, I can kind of, like if I see a CSDMS standard name, I kind of look at it and I see the 
syntax. And I'm like, I think that's a CSDMS gender name. Now with everything you've explained, if I see a scientific variable and how it's actually expressed in plain text, like would I be able to know this is a CSDMS, CSDMS standard name versus a scientific variable, which is richer? Like, could you just explain that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, that is a great question. How are the CSDMS standard names linked to SBO? So, S, uh, so the CSDMS standard names are essentially strings. Um, they have a chosen vocabulary and they follow the pattern of SVO. So on the back end, SVO and CSDMS are built on the same theory, um, which is that you decompose a variable in these two components, and then each component is further decomposed. Um, the difference is that CSDMS standard name is, as I mentioned, it's a string. So you're chaining together these different terms that here, for example, in this last slide that I have that I'm still sharing, um, you can see how this variable has been decomposed into what we call atomistic components. And so an SVO representation of a scientific variable would be this machine readable cluster or bundle of information and relationships between entities, it would never really be something that you as a user look at. Um, what I would do is that this would be stored as some data structure inside of a computer. And then I would have um, a translation mechanism that would um, take these individual atomistic components and it would string them together um, in a specific sequence based on where they are in this structure that I'm showing on the screen. Does that, does that answer your question? Thank you, host, and sorry for muting myself. Um, okay, so I unmuted. It does answer my question, except so it's complicated. It's a struct, a data structure. I don't know, like I may not be able to look at it as plain text, but then when it's stringed together, <laughs> when it's like interpreted and then stringed together, do I have to know this is a scientific variable from SVO, not a CSDMS standard name, or should I just not think about that? I think you should not think about that. Yeah, I think what's important for you is to know, is this the scientific variable that describes whatever I'm trying to label? Yeah, yeah. So this is more the back end. This is so that the computer knows um, what that scientific variable name stands for. Thank you very much. I'm a very, uh, I can only think of concrete things. So thank you for your explanation. <laughs> Are there any final questions? Uh, um, this is Scott. I, I thought I would just add that one way to think about this is this representation is, a, I think of it as an RDF bundle with all this extra detail. But you can serialize that. You can you can fake make some rule, as Maria said, to sort of go from that to just a string that has these parts. And we had a, a way to do that with, with the CSDMS standard names that use different characters like double underscores and tildes and and other symbols, hyphens, to, to be able to, to sort of serialize that. That was one proposed way to do it. But it, it wasn't possible to infer everything from that string that is captured in this bundle. This bundle is much more rich in terms of, of describing what, what actually is going on. So you, you kind of want both. You'd want the machine representation, but you'd also want some kind of a handy string that a human can just read and sort of hopefully say, yeah, that's my variable. And I, I'd also add a big part of this is disambiguation. There's In science, there's often concepts that are very closely related, but they're not the same thing. And a lot of problems with machine with interaction between resources is, is people are not specific about what they mean. Uh, there's lots of examples like um, if you think of heat capacity, if you've had a thermodynamics class, um, they have four, five, six different concepts of heat capacity, whether it's 
isobaric or isochoric or isothermal and whether it's mass specific or volume specific. So all that has to be captured to fully disambiguate the concept of, of heat capacity. And uh, that disambiguation until you, till you're sure there's nothing you can conflict with, like rain rate. What kind of rain rate? Is it a volume flux, a mass flux? There's lots of ways to talk about rain rate. So which one are you talking about exactly in this resource? Um, so that I, I just, just throw that out there and hopefully that makes it a, a little bit more clear. And it looks like there's a question in the chat. Have you by chance represented many of the NWIS parameter codes already as an exercise? Yes. So that was done about, I want to say two and a half or three years ago is the last time that we pulled the NWIS parameter codes. Um, I said NWIS parameter codes, um, but there's also something that's called the SRS names, which are closely related to the NWIS parameter codes. And that's actually what we pulled up. Um, but that was several years ago. And I know that they're populating it with more. Um, we don't have the new ones, um, but we did do the ones that were available about three years ago, I want to say. Yeah, yeah and actually that oil slick example that I had provided was from that list. Yeah, this is Scott again. Um, one of the reasons for tackling NWIS in the CF convention standard names early on was to to make sure that we had a rich collection of existing names that had been already been identified as important and to use them as test cases for, for whether our system could represent all of those. And so both of those standard name collections has a pretty large collection of things and they're in different contexts. Uh, the endless stuff is mostly aquatic chemistry, but a little more than that. And the, uh, the CF is mostly climate and forecasting variables with the atmosphere and ocean. But they're both large. And so by, by showing that we could take every one of those names and represent it like this was a test that we had enough breadth to, to do whatever might come along. Oh, Risa, would you like to ask a question? Am I saying the name right? Okay, I, I didn't. I didn't know I could unmute myself. Okay. Um, I, I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm wondering is maybe, maybe I'm, I'm not thinking about like the level, um, the level of this correctly, but like how flexible is it um, for, for example, for a scientist to or scientists to, you know, want to like redefine a certain, a certain part of. Um, of something that's going to change other things like yeah, like, a, like a relation like redefine a relationship um and then that's going to affect how something else is is defined but i mean this is all based on definition anyway mm -hmm. so yeah. how, how, like where does this stand as a standard in the hierarchy of scientific you know practice yeah so that's a really great question um so Again, I um, SVO does not aim to be a standard. However, um, what we try to do, um, and I think if I'm answer, if I'm understanding your question correctly, um, I think you can see. For example, I have this example up on the screen right now that I think you can see um, because we have this. Uh, saved as a kind of a bundle data structure, uh, it actually is very flexible in changing. Um, for example, you could just take this representation and you could go from, um, say, this Brachionis organism to a different type of organism. And you would have the exact same representation. It's just that you would change uh, the genus of the organism that you're talking about. And so having this kind of representation does allow us to swap things and then to insert new design patterns. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and we do think that this is very helpful and it's very useful as opposed to a standard name where, um, you know, you would have to have a group of people coming together and deciding, you know, oh, is this standard name sufficient or do we have to change, you know, yeah. and having kind of a discussion about it. So we do believe that this is more flexible in that respect and in, in making small changes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, this is Scott again. I'm sorry I keep jumping in, but I keep having thoughts I want to share triggered by these questions. Um, for, for those of you that haven't ever thought about ontologies before, which included me a few years ago, this diagram and these has all these words that start with has, that's not something we made up. This is following a um, some very well -estab established web standards like the RDF standard from the W3C group and um, things like SCOS and OWL. So there's a there's a uh, th there are technology standards and, and ways that are used widely across the internet behind the scenes for representing things about the toaster you might want to buy or or something you want a, an airline flight or whatever and they use exactly these kinds of diagrams under the hood to organize that metadata but to do it for a new for for whatever area you're thinking about you need to develop the ontology for that class of things. So, so when you do a faceted search for the best flight, or when you do a faceted search online for the best um, item you want to buy, um, under the hood, there are representations like this. They're allowing the machine to, to uh, help understand what you're looking for and to present things to you in a way that's useful to you. So this is all following very well-established standards. We didn't make up the standards. We're just, we're making the standard names conform to those standards is a way to think about it. Mark. <laughs> hey, thanks Maria. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I. I just wanted to mention something that resonated with me that you just said is like making standard names is kind of hard. I know that I've struggled with that over the years and I've, I've bugged Scott, I've bugged you, I've bugged Eric. And I like the, the way you, you, the way you described it and that, you know, the bundle, the data structure is more flexible and you don't have to have a committee of people sitting around trying to figure out how to construct the standard name. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to say that I, I like that. I, I like that ex explanation you gave. Thank you. <laughs> And Leslie, I think. Hi, thanks. I was trying to type it, but I'm a very slow thinker and typer. Okay, this is related to what Mark was just saying. I was wondering if there's an example from a CSDMS model usage and standard name where that standard name was kind of ambiguous and like it wasn't enough to describe it all the way so that this concept helped to describe the variable or concept more fully. Yeah, so I think um, I'm just pulling this off the top of my head. So this is not a super concrete example, but I'm pretty sure this is kind of close. Um, so I believe there were two names that were overlapping um, that were one of them was referring to groundwater. And the other one was referring to water. Uh, um, like in the ground, but below the land surface or something like that. It was essentially two things that were referring, both were referring to groundwater, uh, but one was referring to groundwater in terms of uh, the water being like in the ground. And the other one was referring to it as being water under the land surface. And uh, when we decomposed it this way, what we found was that essentially the water under the land surface, the land surface provides a context um, and it being in the ground provides a different context, but they are not contradictory contexts. And so those two names would actually be compatible with each other, but they're just slightly different representations of the same concept, the same scientific variable. Um, is that, does that kind of answer your question? That totally answers my question and gives me a 
concrete example to think of if what I, if what I understand of like groundwater with a capital G versus just like water under the surface of the earth. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, this got again, just adding a couple of my favorite examples, like uh, some, we learned early on that some uh, properties of things involve a pair of objects, and those objects have some relationship to each other. So for instance, a friction factor uh, has to talk about two things that are in contact, like pavement and rubber. And it's only when you have the two participants, pavement and rubber, identified that, that you have a, then a friction factor defined for those two things. It's impossible to really represent that context in just a string. It, you know, it, it might be sort of intuited from reading the string that if I say concrete rubber friction factor, you might understand that the concrete and rubber have to be touching, that that's part of the idea, but that touching context is not really clear from the string. Um, another example is anytime you have a medium where you have one thing in another, like uh, when molten metals mixed together, there's miscibility and there's solubility for things in water or whatever, or there's water in soil. So whenever there's something in something else, like a medium or carbon dioxide in water, you can't, you can't fully capture that containment context unless you have classes like this. We tried to do it with the order in which the object part things were, were presented. So it kind of was a drill down uh, mechanism, but it, it really wasn't fully adequate for for those kind of things and another one is is if you the earth and the moon have a special relationship to each other and if you want to talk about things involving the two of them together like the gravitational pull of you know the moon on the earth or vice versa um those are two things that are interacting in the form of unit but they're not touching and they're not contained there's no containment and there's no touching but there's this still this connection through gravity between these two things. So that the context is really important to try to say, well, how do these two or more objects relate to each other? Or is one inside the other? Is one touching the other? Is one pulling on the other? Um, so I think of it a lot like that. Are there any final questions or comments? Uh, I have kind of a question for Maria. Um, we, I, when you talked about references, um, you didn't elaborate too much on that, but does that include like, um, when I think of that, I think about there are certain properties that are only defined if you introduce a mathematical model first. Like if you want to talk about landscape uh, profile curvature, there's an implicit assumption that you can do two derivatives of the landscape, but the landscape is really a not a smooth mathematical surface. So you have to introduce this construct of a twice differentiable surface as a model for the landscape before that becomes defined. Or, or for the Earth, you have to introduce the concept of an ellipsoid before the semi-major axis of the Earth is defined. Or you have to introduce the concept of a black body before you can talk about the black body temperature of the Earth. And so there's these abstractions that you that are often mathematical or, or physical, like the black body example, that you have to put in place first before the quantity you want to talk about is, is really defined. And is, is, that the, is that properly handled by the reference uh, uh, category? I think for the ellipsoids, um, that is more in the abstraction realm. So in that class of category, um, the reference is more for things like um, like specifically quantities that um, are used um, to provide, I'm sorry if I don't say this exactly right. Um, they're used to provide a reference point for the measurement um, of some value of a scientific variable. So for example, um, altitude is measured with respect to um, the Earth's surface, let's say, um, or um, yeah, so things like that. So it's for, for a concrete quantity, whereas what you're saying with the ellipsoid and applying a model, that would be in the abstraction class. Um, and mm -hmm. you could definitely, the, these are things that are, 
not 100% worked out in SVO at the moment, um, but I could see how you could link a reference to um, an abstraction um, <clears throat> in the sense that a, a reference would be associated with an abstraction. Yeah, another another one is datums, like the mean sea, which you can define by mean sea level or by other means. But uh, in that case, you're defining a reference of, of where sea level is on yeah, a yeah. shaped planet or, or whatever. And but there are more than one. There's more than one way to define a datum or an ellipsoid. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and another example I like is uh, a, a river center line. Like if you're going to talk about the sinuosity of a river, you have to impose some concept of a center line. But there really isn't a well-defined center line to a river. So you have to lay this mathematical concept into the into that situation before that concept of sinuosity really makes full sense. Mm -hmm. An abstract abstract abstraction, like you said. Well, I think we're getting close to the top of the hour. Uh, thank you so much, Maria and Scott, for uh, providing the webinar. We really do appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we'll go ahead and send you uh, the link to the presentation. It's been recorded. And please feel free to uh, circulate it with any colleagues that you think may also uh, benefit from it. Thank you so much.